passes around. Um, I'm super stoked. We are finishing our Exodus series. Um, I think I forget forgot how long this book was when we started this series. And like halfway through, I was like, man, why did I pick such a long book um, <laughs> to do a series on? Um, but we're going to do our last two chapters and be finished with the book of Exodus. Um, start again, chapter 39. Um, it's a really amazing last two chapters. It was really fun to study out. Um, a lot of it is detailing um, the final stages of uh, them building the tabernacle in the middle of the desert. It's really awesome. So the title of our lesson is going to be Holy to the Lord. In verse 1 of chapter 39, it says, From blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, they made woven garments for ministering in the sanctuary. They also made sacred garments for Aaron, as the Lord commanded Moses. They made an ephod of gold and of blue, purple and scarlet yarn, and of finely twisted linen. They hammered out thin sheets of gold and cut strands to be worked into the blue, purple, and scarlet yarn and fine linen, the work of a skilled craftsman. They made shoulder pieces for the ephod, which were attached to... to two of its corners so it could be fastened. Its skillfully woven waistband was like it, one of one piece with the ephod and made with gold and with blue, purple, and scarlet yarn and with finely twisted linen as the Lord commanded Moses. They mounted onyx stones in gold filigree settings and engraved them like a seal with the names of the sons of Israel. Then they fastened them on the shoulder pieces of the ephod as memorial stones for the sons of Israel as the Lord commanded Moses. They fashioned the breast piece, the work of a skilled craftsman. They made it like the ephod of gold and of blue and purple and scarlet yarn and of finely twisted linen. It was square, a span long and a span wide and folded double. Then they mounted four rows of precious stones on it. In the first row, there was a ruby, a topaz, and a beryl. In the second row, a turquoise, a sapphire, and an emerald. In the third row, a jacinth, and an agate, and an amethyst. In the fourth row, a chrysolite, an onyx, and a jasper. They were mounted in the gold filigree settings. There were 12 stones, one for each of the names of the sons of Israel, each engraved like a seal with the name of one of the 12 tribes. For the breast piece, they made braided chains of pure gold, like a robe. They made two gold filigree settings and two gold rings and fastened the chains to the rings at the corners of the breast piece and the other ends of the chains to the two settings and attached them to the shoulder pieces of the ephod at the front. They made two gold rings and attached them to the other two corners of the breast piece inside the edge next to the ephod. Then they made two more gold rings and attached them to the bottom of the shoulder pieces on the front of the ephod, close to the seam just above the waistband of the, blue, of the ephod. They tied the rings of the breast piece to the rings of the ephod with blue cord connecting it to the waistband so that the breast piece would not swing out from the ephod as the Lord commanded Moses. A lot of reading, but, and there's more. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't finish it. Um, but the amazing thing is all of these are instructions on how to make the uniforms for the priests, for Aaron and his two sons. Now, um, it's kind of like outdated, and I usually catch up to things when they're over, but like the whole TikTok, like, like fit trend, like fit check, you know what I mean? <laughs> is imagine your, 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 your priest doing like a, a fit check. And they have gold chains. They have rubies and all of these different minerals and stones and diamonds on their chest. They have gold plaques everywhere. Um, and if you were to skip down further where I, I didn't read, they had a plaque on their turban that said, Holy to the Lord. And I thought about this because I was like, wow, like this sounds like amazing. Like getting dressed up like this to go to, go to work. Like that was the uniform given to you to go to work, wow. right? <laughs> Um, but I was like, wait a second, they're in a desert, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> like, why in the world <laughs> would you need to be dressed like that in a desert? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, that's either like just incredibly outrageous or symbolic, mm -hmm. right? Well, the amazing thing is in First Peter 2, you don't have to turn there. It says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood. Mm. A holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who has called you out of darkness 
into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. And once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Was God had them in the desert, and th this was only one year past. So they had 39 more years to go. Like, I don't know what your ideal, like, you know, apparel would be if you got to spend like a couple years in the desert, right? But like gold, diamonds, rubies, like, they, I don't know if you guys caught that in verse uh, three. It says that they hammered out sheets of gold thin enough for them to cut into strands and work it into their clothes as they sewed it. <laughs> like, I don't even think Gucci does that. I mean, Audrey, correct me if I'm wrong. Somebody correct me, but like sewing gold into your clothes, into the fabric of your shirt and your pants is there's just gold pieces. Like people ask like how many carrots are in your, your jewelry? It's like, hey, how many carrots are in your clothes? Yeah. Like, jeez, right? But the amazing thing is like, yeah, sure, it'd be a bit of an outrageous uniform for the desert. But it's like, wow, that is how God sees you and I is... It says in uh, Galatians 3.27 that we're clothed in Christ Amen. when we're baptized. Mm. And in Ephesians 6, it talks about us wearing the armor of God. Right. And obviously these things are invisible to you and I, but now we see how God sees us dressed every day. Wow. Is we're wearing all of these things. Now, also a really interesting thing about the book of Exodus is Exodus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy are all like, in a sense, parallel accounts. Um, but they leave out one part that Leviticus gives us. On, if you look at Leviticus 10, Come on. is this sounds amazing that God would, would do such a thing for just regular people wandering a desert, right? But it's a bit of a tragic story when you see the response of the priests when they get dressed like this. Come on, bro. It says in Leviticus 10 verse 1, it says, Aaron's sons... Nadab and Abihu took their censers, put fire in them, and added incense, and they offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, contrary to his command. So fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Moses then said to Aaron, this is what the Lord spoke of when he said, among those who approach me, I will show myself holy, and in the sight of all the people, I will be honored. Aaron remained silent. Moses summoned Mishael and Elzaphan, sons of Aaron's uncle Uziel, and said to them, Come here and carry your cousins outside the camp, away from the front of the sanctuary. So they came and carried them, still in their tunics, outside the camp, as Moses ordered. So inside of the tabernacle was a tent. And in that tent, it was, the, it was known as the inner sanctuary. It was where the priests would go and they would minister for the people between them and God. And um, you could have read the last couple chapters before verse 39, or you could go on YouTube. Um, I did both. Um, <laughs> YouTube's a little bit easier, but you can take an entire virtual tour of what the tabernacle would have looked like. It's pretty incredible. Wow. Um, but it was so simple because it seemed like a tragic story. Like, man, like what the heck happened to these two priests? But it was really simple. If you were to read those couple of chapters, it, it explains a really simple process that they were responsible for. So inside of that tent, there was only one light source. There was only one. Most of us uh, are familiar with it during Christmas time. You'll see the uh, menorah. I think there's one. No, it's not right there. But it's essentially that, but with seven strands for seven lights, right? And they had to make sure that this, that stayed lit 24-7. That's it. You have one light. Make sure that they, that stays lit. Um, there was another altar on the side of the tent that was uh, to hold what they called the showbread. Essentially, as long as Israel had bread and they had food to eat, there needed to be a piece of it on the altar to show some sort of thanks to God that he continues to feed them. Remember, they're in the desert. They can't, like, garden and do anything, so God feeds them. So, like, hey, you need to put some of that on the altar to show that you're being fed and that you're grateful. Awesome. Cool. Um, then there's a big curtain, right? The only time that you cross that curtain is when you're doing a sin offering. That's it. Unless you're doing a sin offering, don't go near it. Don't touch it. Don't mess around with it. Don't play around. There's just those four things in the entire tent, right? And uh, um, on the side also was uh, what you see they got in trouble for was they burned unauthorized incense. So when you go back in there to like chapter 36 or 35, 
with the incense altar. All it was was one time in the morning and one time at night. You would go and you would put incense in it and make sure that it was lit. That was it. Once in the morning, once at night, before everybody wakes up and when everybody goes to sleep, go in the tent, minister, light the incense. But you see that Nadab and Abihu, they took censers and they took fire and they walk into the tent and down there in verse 4, it says that their dad Aaron was there. And it says that Aaron's um, cousins, the uh, sons of Aaron's uncle Uziel. So you had Aaron, their father, and their two cousins were there outside the tent as Nadab and Abihu went inside. They weren't supposed to go in there unless everybody was asleep. They were only supposed to do it in the morning and at night. Why are they doing it in front of a bunch of people? Why is there a party? Because yeah. Moses is even there. <laughs> and I thought about it. I was like, man, that's so incredible. Is when you give people such nice things, how big their head gets. Yeah. <laughs> right? Because that's you and I too. Yeah. That is you and I too. Is when you, uh, there's a, a really awesome quote from Abraham Lincoln. Um, it says, if you want to test somebody's character, give them power. And there's a proverb that says that there's a furnace for gold, right? But the furnace for a man's heart is when he's given praise, wow. right? Is when we're exalted and when we're lifted up so high and we get popular and we get success and we get a little bit of money, we get some credentials and we graduate and our heads get so big. Our heads get so big, our egos get so big. And we think that we're like, man, we could rewrite all these rules and we can make a better system. And like, we got it going on and we can just, hey, like I know that there's a rule book, you know what I mean? But like that was, you know, back when we got graded on stuff like this, but like, like, hey, like what's a rule book for, right? And we see that it cost them their lives. Was that they're the big men in the gold and you know, decked out, and they're the ones that are fitted. So, like, hey, they, they can just make up the rules as they go. And unfortunately, that's not how God works. Um, we can keep reading in chapter 40. So back to Exodus. And I think that the way that this can often affect us in our, in our walk with God, um, and, and I thought about this, um, uh, I, I, there, was a, there was a story um, that was uh, uh, about a car accident that happened recently, um, but there was a guy, and um, he was on a, his, his first date with just some girl, and they're in this like really nice like sports car, it was like really cranking car. All decked out. I don't know if there's a, um, I don't know, I could probably tell me what kind of car it was if I showed. Um, but um, he got pulled over for going 100 miles an hour down, like, a, just a main road, essentially, right? And the cop had some, like, compassion on him. I was like, hey, dude, like, I'm going to give you a ticket, but, like, I should take you to jail and, like, tow this car. Like, please slow down. And um, lets the guy go, and that guy's confidence comes back immediately. And he goes blazing down the road. And that cop pulls up to a car accident. Mm -hmm. And he sees this young man and this young woman dead in a car. Mm -hmm. And this cop is like crushed. He's like, dude, I pulled those guys over like 10 minutes ago. Mm -hmm. Like, man, like that kid, like, I, I, like, I don't, like, why, like, why would you do that? Like, mm -hmm. Like, I pull him over. I told him, like, dude, like, don't be cocky. Don't show off in front of a girl. Like, like don't, don't let your ego get, like, you could have killed somebody. You could have killed yourself. And 10 minutes later, the guy did the exact same thing. Mm. It was terrible. In chapter 40, verse 30, it says, He placed the basin between the tent of meeting in the altar and put water in it for washing and Moses and Aaron and his sons used it to wash their hands and feet. They washed whenever they entered the tent of meeting or approached the altar as Lord commanded Moses. When Moses set up the courtyard around the tabernacle and the altar and put up the curtain at the entrance to the courtyard so Moses could finish the work. When the cloud covered the tent of meeting 
and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not even enter the tent of meeting because a cloud had settled upon it, and the glory of the Lord had filled the, tent, the tabernacle. In all the travels of the Israelites, whenever the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle, they would set out. But if the cloud did not lift, they did not set out until the day it lifted. So the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day, and fire was in the cloud by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel during all their travels. Is This obviously takes place before um, Nadab and Abihu um, sinned against God and offered unauthorized fire. Um, but this is such an amazing way to end Exodus because they're about to embark. And um, if we would have looked in uh, chapter 40, um, verse... Man, where is it at? Verse 16, it says, this was, the first day, this was the first day of the first month of their second year. So they had 39 more years to go. And it, it's so incredible. It says that a cloud, right, would settle over the tent. And any time the cloud lifted, they knew that it was time for them to set out and for them to move and travel. And for 39 years, that's how they would travel, was they would just follow God, right? It's super incredible. And it says that it was a cloud. And I was like, man, like, um, the YouTube video kind of made it look like smoke, so I, I didn't really catch it, but I kept reading. I was like, no, dude, like that's a cloud. That's different from smoke. Yeah. And I thought about it was uh, um, at, before the day ends, I, I usually like to look up in the sky and check out the clouds because mm -hmm. um, we're like 7,000 feet above, you know, where we were at a couple of months ago in California. And, <laughs> um, and every time we're, we're like driving somewhere, I'm like, babe, like we look so much closer to the clouds. I don't know if I'm, I don't know if I'm crazy. Like I might be crazy, but like I'm pretty sure we can see these things better than we did a couple months ago. And um, I went and I researched, right? Um, they said, uh, observationists say that the optimal um, elevation level to view stars and clouds and the atmosphere is at 7,000 feet. And we're at like 7,200 feet. So like, I don't know, like would it be better if we were 2,000 feet lower? I don't know. But essentially they say, that we could see 25% more clearly wow. the sky, the clouds, and the stars because we're so high right now, wow. right? But I was like, man, could you imagine like a cloud like just sitting on top of this house? Like how amazing that would be. And then at nighttime, there would, it would be like a night light. It would be filled with fire and it would light your surroundings. And even if you had to travel at night, you could do that because of the cloud, yeah. right? I'm like, man, that's so amazing. Right, and I think Nadab and Abihu, you know, they eventually go and they sin out and they try and rewrite the rule book, unfortunately, to their demise. But I'm like, man, like, I think for you and I, and I think for our generation, our society today, is there's this slogan that, hey, nobody's perfect. Mm -hmm. So because nobody's perfect, like, hey, like, do we have to try that hard? You know, like, do we really have to follow, like, explicit, like, instructions if we can't be perfect? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Right? Because I'm super like this in my nature. So I have to be, like, extra vigilant, and I read my Bible a ton because of that, and it helps me, you know, beat my bad thoughts with good thoughts, good ideas. <laughs> right? Because I can have a lot of bad ideas. You know what I mean? So all right, I read my Bible a lot. It can kind of help, you know, get me a little bit more balanced. You know what I'm saying? But in my nature, I'm super like this. If I'm not going to be successful at something or near perfect at something, like, as soon as Ina came into the church and started slaughtering everybody oh, at, like, yeah. a ping pong <laughs> at table tennis, I'm like, I, don't, I, haven't played te I haven't played ping pong in, like, forever. I don't think she's got, since she's got baptized, I've, like, I'll, always, I'll pick it up if she's not there. You know what I mean? Um, whenever we go bowling, either Derek or Blake win, so I haven't been bowling in months. You know? So it's in my nature. is like, man, like, if I'm not going to win, if I'm not going to be perfect, I, like, yeah. like, why try and I think that's why Bible literacy is like at an all-time low in the world right now. Mm. Is they do censuses and they, and they ask believing people and church-going people, like, how well do you know your Bible? Um, I think the girls went and did a, a um, Bible trivia on campus the other day. And um, who did they think Joan of Arc was? Wait, uh, who got swallowed by a whale? Is that Joan of Arc got swallowed by a whale? <laughs> and Moses. And I'm like, Moses and Joan of Arc inside a whale. Like, Jesus, what Bible are you reading, friend? You know? But we just don't know the Bible. 
because hey like we're not going to be perfect anyway so do we really need to know all this stuff mm-hmm. like do we really need to know all this stuff if like we're just going to like fail at the end of the day mm-hmm. and i think absolutely right. i think it is the most dangerous cop out that we have decided to take in the 20 this postmodern 21st century christian world is we don't know the bible because hey we couldn't do it anyways and guys it is going to be to our demise yeah. is it could cost us our life I think the, it's the most amazing thing is you read the book of Exodus and you see how stubborn and how sinful and how rebellious his people were. Mm-hmm. But man, they, they were able to follow the cloud. Like they did do that well. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> they did. Is you, you skip from Exodus, I think you uh, read through Numbers yeah. if you want to see how it went for them. They followed the cloud and they did a good job. And in the same way is we have the very presence of God right here. That if you just follow the cloud, it'll work out. It's not about being perfect, but it's about following him. Yeah. Yeah. Right? If you want to go over to First Peter, Come on, Nick. We'll, we'll turn the corner here. I quoted from this passage earlier. But in verse 17... It says, since you call on a father who judges each man's work impartially, live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him, you believing in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and hope are in God. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. This is through the living and enduring word of God. It is our faith And like it says in verse 22, through our obedience to the truth, it says that the sacrifice of Jesus is enough. The sacrifice of Jesus is enough for our imperfections. That's why we don't have to be perfect. Praise God. Is no one has to be perfect because, man, we'd all be in big trouble if that was the case. Right? But it says through us being purified by the obeying to the truth, that we'll learn sincere love for our brothers, for the world. Right? Is um, it was so interesting. I watched. Uh, um, I don't know if anyone is in mixed martial arts here, um, but um, we had big fights out in um, Abu Dhabi last night. So I was watching the. Um, my brother orders a pay per view, and I'll just watch it after him. You know, so I get. I usually get the the Instagram notifications and the ESPN app before the fights happen, and I just I learned to watch a spoiled fight. But is you have all of these MMA fighters, and these guys got like messed up ears, like worse than mine. And they're like cut up and all bloodied and tired and they look like mean and they're all on edge because they just fought for 30 minutes, you know. And almost every single one of these fighters, just they refused to, they refused to celebrate their victories. None of them celebrated their wins That's true. That's true. because they were in Abu Dhabi and they were all commenting on Palestine and on Israel. Mm-hmm. And I was like, man, you got these guys that are like hard dudes like not the nicest guys in the world obviously like their career doesn't really allow for them to be like incredibly kind people especially like on on fight night you know what i mean um as they take months to prepare mentally and get themselves in a place where they're willing to go in a cage and like get choked out and like punch a guy a knee guy and elbow a guy and try and break bones but like man like even these guys are able to like refrain themselves and not celebrate because they see like man the world is so bad like they uh one of uh it, it was really surprising because if anyone's heard of kamzat chemaev um this guy is like one of the meanest dudes in the entire ufc this guy is mean like nasty guy and his message was the most heartfelt and it was the sweetest of everybody and i was like man like how incredible is this guy has found a lot of success and he didn't let it all go to his head. Mm-hmm. But for so much of us, it's so easy to just not be aware of everything going on in the world, right? 
but it tells us right here that we need to learn to love sincerely and deeply from the heart. And it's obvious that the world so lacks that, right? So at the very least that we can do is like, hey, man, I might not be perfect. I might not be perfect. Jesus' sacrifice is enough for that. But man, like I got to get into my Bible. I got to follow the cloud. And I got to make sure that my head's not too big and that I'm not just strutting around in front of God like royalty, right? It's not to strut around in front of God, but to walk humbly with them and to follow the cloud. But amen, guys. Let's uh, let's say a prayer.